you have to start thinking like a turkey and realize what they're going to do next and also sort of learn their language. I mean, turkeys are always talking. They have a tremendous language of their own and many, many different vocalizations that mean different things. So that's part of the reason why Ben Franklin didn't want the eagle. He thought the wild turkey was a far more majestic, honorable animal. People think turkeys as being stupid and you know, drowned in the rain, all this stuff, which isn't true. That all got based where people went out and bought baby turkeys and brought them home and didn't properly house them and it rained and they all drowned. But my response to that is take a human baby and put it out in a rainstorm and see how long it, it survives. It'll put its head up and drown. Um, you know, that had more to do with just really bad care. Now, the other side of it is that the modern industrial turkey that everybody buys at Thanksgiving is a lot stupider. But that's because man, when they've decided to take the turkey off the land and house them in buildings, actually began to select for stupidity. Because if you have an animal that you don't want it to do anything, you want it just to just eat and stand there and gain weight, you don't want it to have any intelligence. <laughs> they like to be where the action is. I finally learned why drugs are so essential to factory farming poultry. Healthy birds don't require drugs, sick mutated ones do. Turkeys have been so genetically altered that they're no longer even capable of having sex. They're all artificially inseminated. I learned that because corporations want to pay less for feed and Americans like the taste of fat, today's meat birds have been bred with mutant obese genes to grow faster and fatter than ever imaginable before. So much faster and fatter that if a human baby had her growth similarly accelerated, a two month old would weigh more than 600 pounds. They're trapped in these bodies that keep them from doing normal animal behavior. Lab normal is now called normal. 50 years ago, these chickens wouldn't have survived on the farm. The family farm was the original small business in this country. It was this notion that through your own hard work and your own decisions, you can either succeed or fail. And that was an idea that embedded itself in the American way, that embedded itself in the American economy and culture, and lasted until the 1970s when we changed what economic sovereignty meant. You know, the almighty good and the best object you can achieve is just cheapness. Make the food as cheap as you possibly can. And as long as it's cheap, People really didn't care how it was produced. We still hold this idea in our head that there's capitalism out there in rural America, that we have independent farmers that rise or sink based on how well they do. What we really have now is a system that looks a lot like a Soviet Politburo system. It's a system based on central planning, central ownership, centralized control. I mean, you've literally got a control room in Springdale, Arkansas, with people typing away on computers, figuring out how many chickens are going to be raised on farms in the state of Georgia or North Carolina or Mississippi. John Tyson and his son Don were brilliant businessmen. You know, he started out by hauling, you know, fruit from Arkansas to Kansas City, and then when that went under, then he started hauling chickens, and then that's what started his business. He had a lot of guts. Don Tyson was brilliant and visionary and ruthless and completely unsentimental. He was born in near poverty. The northwest corner of Arkansas was the poorest corner of one of the poorest states in the country. Nobody showed a great measure of pity to him when he was growing up, and I don't think he felt he owed that to anybody else. 
The chicken business is pretty simple then. We grew one chicken, it made money. We grow two chickens, it makes money. We grow more. And so that, that's the history of our company. But as it grew, he ran into the problems that I have today. The demand fluctuated too much. He had to find a way where he had a product that didn't change, that was identical, and was in demand 12 months out of the year. Don spent 12 years going to McDonald's saying, I can make chicken cheaper than anybody can make a pound of beef or a pound of pork. And finally, after 12 years, they, they saw what he was seeing. And that was the Chicken McNugget. He was always capable of putting the, the risk, the loss, the chances on other people, preferably his farmers. They always paid the price when things failed. He invented the tournament system. It is truly a Machiavellian and brilliant system that all these companies now use. The tournament is unique in that most farmers get paid a certain price for the commodity they raise. You know, corn farmers, soybean farmers, there's a market price for their product. But chicken farmers get paid based on the terms of this tournament. Tyson will take all the farmers in an area and then it'll rank them based on how efficiently their birds were fattened up on a given ration of feed that Tyson provided. Based on your ranking, you're either paid a premium price or your pay is cut. And that is the bonus that's given to the farmers at the top. It makes it so all farmers know that if they're going to do well, it is gonna be at the expense of their neighbors. So it systematically divides and conquers rural communities. It makes sure that farmers don't cooperate, they don't share information. If I try to compare the results of my tournament to my neighbors, I can actually be sued by the company. I have no desire whatsoever for my kids to do this. I've got more faith in them, and they're smart enough to not do what their daddy did. And uh, I just had such a bug to get back to the farm. I got nobody's butt to kick but mine for getting into it. Um, but I will keep them out of it. My 13-year-old son has never set foot in his house, neither with my other son or my daughter. I don't you know one chicken farmer that's happy. It's that disrespect for farmers for what we are to this business and to be treated like a, uh, like a serf. Somebody called it indentured servitude. A indentured servant doesn't have $500,000 worth of debt. I trade places with him. Year after year, the lopsided contracts reduced Craig to little more than a low-level manager of his own farm owning nothing more than the houses, the waste, and the dead birds. His chief concern becomes protecting his family from the danger of their massive debt. It's not just the unwinding of a way of life. There is, perhaps, an exhaustion of spirit. 